All right. All right. So thank you everybody for joining us yet again. Uh, this is the second to last band, band Books Week program. So made it almost to the week. We have one more tomorrow. Feel free to be here. I'll be here on Saturday too. Um, band Books Week is an annual event that celebrates the freedom to read within the spotlight of, sorry, within putting a spotlight on the harms of censorship. This annual event is celebrated by librarians, Booksellers, publishers, journalists, teachers, and readers. It is now my pleasure to introduce Carmen. So most of you know me. <laughs> and I'm so glad you made it here. Very good. Think of this as part of your learning. The best learning that you're ever going to get at this university is going to be when you are rubbing elbows with real folks. All right? It's not going to be behind a book. Not going to be behind a laptop. Not going to be in the classroom listening to me droning on and on. It's coming to events like these and really soaking it in and living your life, living your best life, understanding how other people see the world through their lens, how they interpret it, how they use different genres to interpret it. We have been dealing all this semester in stories, and this is just a different genre, poetry through which those stories are told, okay? So listen, different. <laughs> uh, because you will be writing your own story at the end of the class, right? Uh, for your final. You will be writing your own narrative. You will be synthesizing the world as you see it. Okay, with that, I just want to tell you that the format for this is, it's going to be an in-conversation format a little bit different from the other setups that we've had all week. I love it because I know that you guys have wonderful synergy. <laughs> so draw in the student audience if you like, I'll leave it up to you. Um, with that, I try to make these events as much a student run thing as I can. So I'm here to introduce a wonderful, lovely for help. And she is a student here as well as you. She's a senior. Um, she, her, her major is global studies. And she has not one, but three minors. One of those minors is legal. The other is philosophy. And the other is AFAM studies. So she has quite a wonderful path that she's carving out for herself by delving into a lot of different areas while she's here at university. Um, she is also a Gilman scholar and a wonderful sorrow, AKA, she's wearing her colors today with her jacket. So take it away, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Shaka Campbell. Shaka is the first Black Santa Clara County Poet Loret. He was awarded the combination in the arts from the city of Milpitas and Sunnyvale, respectively. He has authored three books of poetry entitled Tar Man, Muted Whispers, Stuff I Wrote and More, and Tunnel Vision within his eagerly anticipated letters to my daughter. Shaka is not only an artist, but an accomplished performer and was voted one of the 25 people to know in San Francisco. He collates, including not only being a member of the 2004 New Yorkian Poetry National Poet, Poet I think I pronounced that right, wrong. New Yorkian. Um, you got it. I got it. Okay, good. Uh, poetry National uh, Poetry Slam Team and the Hollywood National Champion Slam Poetry Team 2006, but the Grand Champion of two, San Francisco's 2005 and Hollywood's 2007 poetry competitions. He was also awarded the Best Unsigned UK Artist in 2010, and he toured internationally and has been featured at the legendary Apollo Theater in New York and the Poetry Cafe and the O2 Arena in London, England. His words have been featured in Bridges Review, BBC UK, Content Magazine, Speak Easy Volume 1, Liminal Animals, Rigorous Magazine, and elsewhere. He has four spoken word albums entitled One, Budlines, Skin Volume 1, and his most recent, Kisi, currently available on all streaming platforms. Shaka has collaborated on a number of musical po uh, projects in genres of house, jazz, blue, and blue. In fact, Shaka Campbell is a brother to us all in San, San Jose and continues to ask the world to listen different. 
join us in welcoming Shaka Kanso. I um well first, how are you? How are we doing? Good. 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 There's more than four people in this room. <laughs> how are we doing? How are you doing? Yes. Okay. All right, fantastic. So um I always hate bios because I feel super old after they get done. But um anyway, we are here. Um I'm actually uh, super excited and honored to be to be asked to be in this space, not only because Carmen uh, Professor asked me, but just because um, I always sort of revel in being able to get in front of folks and have conversations, um, you know, regardless of age group, right, just to, to have conversations and, and to talk about words and language and stories and history and all of that stuff and how how it's all sort of formed together. So today, what I'm going to do, just to kind of give you guys a quick little bit of a run through, I'm going to do uh, a poem just to, uh, well, I don't even know if it's a poem. It's like a poem story. It's like a storm or something like this, like this <laughs> mix of things uh, that I wrote uh, just to start it up. And then I'll introduce James and then uh, James and I are going to chat it up. Sound good? All right. That's like four people. Like, sound good? Good. Hey. Right, cool. So uh, the poem, the, the, the thing I'm going to do, right, it's called um, Nuclear, or called Connections. I, I, I still haven't made up my mind yet. Um, but how this poem came about, right? Um, I was listening to a reading by Rochelle Escamala, and they used the word thistle in their poem, right? Thistle, I'd heard the word before, but I remember thinking thistle, I like this word. The way it seemed to to carry itself with a certain flair, as if it wore a top hat to get groceries. It was the way the the the, the whistle through the teeth of this, as if it was on its way to somewhere important. Fissile, so established and proper. Fissile got stuff to do. Can't dilly dally. All right. So when I got home, I looked up the word because I wanted to better own its vocabulary. I I, I wanted to make it springboard to my tongue. So I yelled out, hey, Siri, what does the word fissile mean? Fissile, it said, was capable or prone to being split or divided in the direction of the grain. Now I reached back into the past hour to align what I thought they said in that poem with what was now being told to me. Now with this banned book event coming up, eating at the back of my mind, I thought, that's exactly who we become when we don't have access. When you're not sure of the story of the word, we are prone to being split or divided in the direction of the grain. Now, I love the word even more, right? I repeated it over and over, and it flossed through my teeth, fissile, fissile, like something that starts as a soft breeze to then later explode to hurricane when it reaches the other side of the tongue, fissile, like a hard breath spat out in flame, like the breath under pressure in here behind this chest, a fist of inhaled cough, the fire breathing from a flint itch, a nuclear voice split to ore. The next day, the next day I skipped through the bookshelf to retrieve a dictionary from between the Octavia Butler's patent maker. And if you don't know that, make sure you read it because the book is bomb. Uh, so in between that book and Mahogany Brown's Woke Baby, which funny enough is on many a band list. Um, I looked between these books and I, and I got the dictionary and I looked up the word fissile again. I wanted to get, get to a definition that I could actually read and, and like run my fingers across the letters to make it real to me. A second definition said, in nuclear en engineering, fissile material is material that can undergo nuclear fission when struck by a neutron of low energy. Now, this is when I knew the universe was working for me with this poem, right? I thought nuclear, the word nuclear split is nuclear. Banning books erases the past and ushers in a new clear and resets and starts over. New, clear history is what they seem to be aiming for. Then the second part read, when struck by a neutron of low energy. Well, when there's an absence of reaction, there's no action. I mean, what kind of energy can be expected when the actual story is stuck from the body so violently as if easy as just proclaiming it as being ideological and therefore banned? Low energy is the only thing that's left. Low energy is the only thing that's left when our history is removed from a system built to forget, 
And we then forget what history said to great, great grandma, who sung it to great grandma, who told grandma during damp winters when the night hung to walls while they braided it in their mama's hair before church, who cooked it in collards to find its way to your stomach and then up through your fists and your fingers that then you wrote down in the book of generation and all that rich context is now apparently not real anymore because of the fact that she wrote it in the first place means it's no longer truth to be legal, to legal, to be truth, but because of these stories, because of these books, because of Los Libros, the Trump, the folk tales, the songs, the hieroglyphics, the hierarchy, the history of culture, the describe, the flame, the truth, the all, the him, the me, the us, the fight, the lost, the loss, the no, the know how, the new, the thought we knew, the truth, the all the things that pages incubate and act me onto the clean of parchment, dotting the new and clear to an explosive exploration of what's actually new and clear. I skim yet another definition, thistle a self-sustaining thermal chain reaction can only be achieved with fissile materials, self-sustaining and change. How familiar to a history where there's little of self when our stories cannot be sustained, when we're all being unwritten with every page turn. Now, two weeks later, I bought the book and it was arriving in the mail. Two weeks later, it arrived. And I eagerly wanted to find the actual poem that uh, she read, that they read. And that started this love affair with the word thistle in the first place. And to my surprise, the word they referenced was actually thistle. Thistle the whole time, T-H-I-S-T-L-E. And, you know, after being embarrassed, I reached for the phone and I asked again to give me a definition of the word and it read thistle the flowers purple and pink colors represent royalty in Victorian England. The thistle signified pain, aggression, intrusion. Receiving a bouquet with thistles would have been interpreted as a warning against meddling in other people's business. Probably the most negative association of the thistle is with evil. And I thought to myself, hmm, Sometimes when the story isn't told in the way it was originally wit written, it changes what we take into the world. And even with this new, new clear information, the conclusion was the same as what I had been grappling with all along, meddling in other people's business. So regardless of the definition of interpretation, context always matters. Thank you. Uh, Again, I don't know what that was. It was a, it was like a poem, a journal entry. It was like all of that all in one. But um, it came about as I was sort of trying to prepare for what I would talk to you guys um, about, or at least start the the um, the the evening off with. So I think you know, again, the universe was was um, shining that time. Anyway, enough of me. I am going to introduce this wonderful individual sitting next to me. Um, James, well, you you guys already know what we're here to do, right? Yeah? God, y'all falling asleep. I need to get up and do jumping jacks or something. <laughs> do some dancing or something. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, anyway, James is a celebrated award-winning poet who has written Martian, The Saint of Loneliness, and Black Steel Magnolias in the Hourglass of Chaos Theory by Nomadic Press 2018. He's the winner of the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award. His second book of poems, Martian Nomadic Press 2022, was selected by Mark Ribbons, Ribbons um, Amy. Well, I'm getting old. Uh, you pronounce that? I, I, yeah. By this really famous person, <laughs> with a long name. Yeah. Should be really impressed. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, Landon Osmond to receive the 2021 James Laudlin Award. James Cagney is a Cave Canem fellow who lives in Oakland, California. Um, please, guys, put your hands together for James. So James is going to give us a couple. Of, I, I'm, I wanted to make sure that um, you guys had an opportunity, 
an opportunity to hear, before we actually get into conversation, to have an opportunity to hear what James does with words, what he does with stories, how he, you know, I always love to say words have they're not only meaning, but they have texture, right? And so um, I wanted you to guys spend some time to hear what um, what and how um, James does his stuff, and then we'll we'll get into chatting over that. One other thing I'll say before I did that long intro, right? About James. All of that aside, this is just an incredible human being, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of the accolades, outside of the reading, just him as a person. Uh, incredible human being. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that I gave him his flowers before I started. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that kindness. Hey, everybody. It is an incredible honor to, to be here with you, to sit here with you and share some work um, and have like a conversation. Um, and I don't want to don't want to meander and and just sort of like chat too, too long. I just want to introduce you to some poems and then engage with uh, Shaka. The first book that I ever officially published is uh, Black Steel Magnolias in the Hour of Chaos Theory. Um, I pub published that almost, wow, I'm, I'm going to have to round that up, maybe five years ago. And my thought in publishing the first book, the first thing that I'm going to present to the world is I wanted to be honest and I wanted to introduce myself. I did not want to assume that I was ever going to produce like a second book I wanted to put everything I could into this first project and kind of introduce myself to, to strangers. One of the major parts of my personal story uh, is that I was adopted when I was a baby. Um, and I met my uh, actual biological family when I was uh, almost 20 years old. In the years of doing poetry though, in the years of doing open mics throughout the Bay Area and beyond, I have so rarely up until almost never before releasing this book ever heard another person speak about themselves being adopted or going through the foster care system or anything such as that. And I felt like this story, which I've never ever heard, I am forced now to engage it and to share it and process it. Um, and shoot, let's give you some examples. This first uh, piece, which is the introductory piece for the book, um, is called uh, Identity to Burn. It, um, and it came from a uh, class that I was taking in Sacramento when I finally and for the first time met and engaged with my biological family on a serious level. Um, while I was taking classes there with them, my, almost my first homework assignment was to write a poem on identity. And I'm like about 30 years old at this point. Um, and because of all this confusion and this division, I don't even know where to start and what to do. My, when I go home, my biological older sister comes into the bedroom where I'm at. And she is like, and she basically says to me, boy, what is you in here doing? And I tell her about this homework assignment. And when she leaves my room uh, in a few minutes, I write a transcript of what just happened. So this is called Identity to Burn. You have to write a poem about identity, she says. Well, when is she going to write about me? When is she going to write about something important? I, when is she going to write about your favorite sister? I know I've given you enough material by now. Look, she says, you got enough identity for the whole class. There may not be enough time for anyone else to speak. Identity, she says. This is going to be the easiest poem you ever wrote. Let's see. Tell them how your family tree wasn't what you thought it was. Tell them about how you was an only child and at 19 found out you was adopted and suddenly had this whole new identity. Tell them about how your mama had seven kids to raise on one check so she gave you to another family so you'd have a better chance at life. Now, they was really too old to have kids, but you don't have to say that. You can say how your mama befriended your how do you say it? Birth mama while she was in beauty school? Miss Cagney was her instructor, huh? Yeah, tell him that. Tell him you didn't know about us, your real family. You just thought you was all alone in this world after your daddy died, your mama died. Tell him about how Medi-Cal did you a number and you became homeless and your other family said, well, drop us a postcard every now and then, baby James. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know you all right. Tell him about how you was born when in 68? 
and reborn in 1999, adopted back into the family you was adopted out of. Now, you don't have to tell them about your love life. I'm saving up to get you a good piece for your birthday. And don't tell about how your brother has been institutionalized or that cousin of yours with the plate in his head who drank himself to death after your mama passed. Shoot, can I get credit for this poem too? I mean, look at you, so much has happened. You got two whole identities, two families, two mamas. One of them's gone now, but you know. I mean, boy, you rolling. You got identity to burn. You can knock this poem out in a few minutes, throw some rhymes in there. It'll be all good. And then, you can start writing about something important. Uh. You can start writing about me. Because I can't see how you made it all these years without me. And I can't imagine why you're having problems writing about identity. Um, uh. my The family that raised me, uh, I ended up, this is a poem featuring my father and my older cousin, uh, John Edward. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just read the poem. This is called Negro Geist. One, Daddy. Old Crow and Jack Daniels understood my father mouthfuls at a time. Jim Bean and Old Forrester were uncles in hard glass suits. They'd roll up in the knuckle crack and sigh of Hennessy taking its first breath, then hound dog laughter and dominoes falling in hail on the graveyard of the dining room table. Relatives who existed only through stories and memory would ease in like zombies on ropes of blue Marlboro and Newport and camel smoke, then demand a seance in spades, coon can, and Texas hold'em. No wonder they called it spirits. Spirits baited my father with Cuvassier, snatching him out of his body like a river catfish, and he vanished like that. Spirits made him burn rubber scream in the driveway, stand on my bed a sloppy marionette and speak in tongues or just toss hands and skillets after midnight. I wouldn't see his ass again until the next afternoon, looking like something had chewed all the sugar out of him and spit the great pulp on the couch. Two, Johnny. My cousin Johnny volunteered for possession every week. Spirits lit that nigga up like Vesuvius. He was certified. Electroshock exorcisms did nothing. Empty bottles and cans were his weekend storm warning. Old English, Coke 45, Crazy Horse, Cisco, they demand sacrifices in blood. So bottles of Haldol and Thorazine would dice roll under the couch. Friday nights, then doors slam to splinters. Tables get flipped. Walls kicked until straight jackets lay waiting on the lawn. Mama would cite visions of gang boys with tire iron erections and Johnny's convertible skull with its metal vent as if it explained anything. It didn't. Between dawn, between dusk Friday and dawn Saturday, he'd still be ready to blow this motherfucker up. You want some of this? Do you want some of this? Oh no, oh yes, oh no, oh yes. I'll be damned, I'll be damned, I'll be damned. Um, let's say, uh, uh, I wanted to do, is that, uh, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. Um, I really like this, uh, little experimental poem. It's called Touch Abstraction. There are hospitals where hands are a type of medicine. I smooth the tremulous lines along your temples with my palm. In these cellular rooms, bodies are worshipped in religions of despair. We burden our mouths to carry more than language. I align your tremulous temples in the rooms of my palm. There are hospitals where medicine is better than hands. In our mouths, bodies become religions and are worshipped with tongues. We trust our language to carry more than we understand. I align your cellular temples with hospitals and hands, hospitals and hands that burden our medicines with lines of disrepair. We praise the smooth bodies in our mouths with psalms of worship. We trust our tremulous language more than religions. My palms carry sparkling medicines into your temple. Our bodies don't understand worship or religions. 
We cannot trust our language any more than our mouths. Some temples are better than hospitals and some medicines useless. Every body I worship suffers. Tremulous religions carried in the hands of language. Um, so when my father died, uh, and I was still in my early 20s, um, I was left to care, to basically do in-home care for my mother, um, who, in all, who was also in the process of, of dying from cancer. I was an only child to her. This is the mother that I was raised with and the one that raised me and adopted. And um, and I felt stuck, quite frankly. I, I loved her, she was my mother, and I also felt obligated and shut down my ability to go to college and, and a lot of things just to focus on her, mostly because when my dad was dying, I was sort of a I was sort of an ass to him and had a lot of issues. It was hard taking care of her alone. Um, and it was frustrating. And how I balanced myself was by kind of doing poetry uh, at, a at a variety of places throughout, uh, throughout uh, the Bay Area. Writing was a good way of healing myself and my frustrations, but I was still angry and I was still frustrated and I was still, still, still. I wrote this poem one night um, in, the, in the midst of a, of a pretty nasty depression. And at that night, it was just my mom and me. And she was asleep on the couch in the living room. I was in my room watching, watching television. And I just remember the feeling that the house that night just seemed to get so astonishingly quiet. It suddenly made me think of uh, how people would describe uh, people in the Midwest would describe when a tornado is about to hit, that how they how they say the air just kind of gets stilled and everything just sort of gets vacuumed out of out of you know out of the environment or whatever. And I felt something akin to that. And this poem uh, came out of me. This poem is called "I Feel a Scream Coming On." Out of the blood-soaked silence like a child buried in a ravine whose spirit tugs at your sleeve and hair like the wind. I feel it coming over the horizon of the bitter truth that nobody believes you're really sick till you're dead and pain is just a cry for attention. I feel it coming out of the clairvoyant silence that haunts this house like neon mice and shivers deep in the shadows where your ugliest secrets hide and watch your uneasy sleep. I feel it simmering down in my gut where compassion has fermented into hate and has become a demon fetus eating its way through vulnerable tissue and bone. It's coming out of my subconscious, whispering mantras I don't need to be reminded of. I already know what's coursing through these veins is deeper than the blues. Even my boss can see I'm worried after I hang up the phone. He asks if everything is all right, and like a fool, for the first time in my life, I tell the truth and say, no, everything's not all right and may never be. She's the one sick, but I'm the one who needs to be taken care of. While my boss rambles, I swallow shots of blood as I bite down on my tongue. Meanwhile, he paces, preaches, his words fall from his mouth in stones and roll to my anxious feet. He says, things change. This too shall pass. Nothing stays fixed forever. He says, maybe you ought to pray. I don't believe in God, he says, but I believe in being quiet. I believe in love and peace. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, Fuck this existential, theological, psychobabble, masturbatory, 60s, hippie, yuppie, motivational, infomercial, self-help bullshit. Peace is what you get when you ask for pie or for ass. And even then, you only get what you pay for. I don't need quotes from the Bible or an advice column. I need a bar fight. I need a bottle of something that tastes like swallowing a snake on fire. I need to be arrested, irresponsible, and mad. I need a lead pipe and a jaw. I need to sink my claws into a motherfucker's chest deep as a blackhead and sharpen my teeth on his gizzard. I feel a scream coming on. 
I'm looking for somebody to mug me, to say, give me all you got. So at first I can pretend to rifle through my pockets for bones or lozenges of blood. Then I can grab him by his neck, look him in his eye and say, you just brought a pistol to a nuclear war, son. Mm. The sound you hear growling like a thundering train is coming out of my throat. It is bile with tentacles. It is a sound that eats. And right now it is all I got to give. So I'm gonna do one more poem then. Right. And then I'm going to turn the mic back over All to right. you. Y'all going to learn today. Uh, huh. this, is, uh, this is in the uh, new book. And I guess I have no further comment than that. Um, this is called, You Have the Right. You have the right to be right. You have the right to claim, to rename, to redefine. You have the right to judge, to frisk, to choke. You have the right to remain standing, to remain whole without being questioned. You have the right to ignore others' rights, to speak for all victims and tell a room full of widowed mothers to shut up. You have the right to not see color and firebomb diversity out of your field of vision. You have the right to invade, to displace, to demoralize. You have the right to feel easily threatened. You have the right to the right side of history and enjoy the good weather of a touring oppressor. You have the right to trivialize the memorials of our dead while your missing daughters are canonized, their schools closed and festooned with roses. You have the right to be inconvenienced by protests, by funerals, by the lives you didn't approve. You have the right to ride to hounds, to turn lynching into a fraternal hazing workout, to turn lynching into a pop-up shop or video game app and award souvenirs. You have the right to not see the problem, to browse safari through our communities, to love wild animals while dismissing grown men as savages, as monkeys. You have the right to prefer a comfortable lie over the truth. You have the right to claim genocide as culture, to fillet weapons and sponsor the indignity of war, to see war as a product, to copyright its blood. You have the right to justify torture and take selfies with the dead. You have the right to be both victim and knife in the dark, to be the dark itself and the light glinting off the blade, to be ubiquitous and unseen. You have the right to ethnically cleanse until culturally clean and repeat. You have the right to misunderstand history just enough, then edit out the facts that make you uncomfortable. You have the right to condescend, to humiliate, to desecrate, to redefine words used against you and dismiss our testimony, to control our prescriptions while telling us we're crazy. You have the right to riot in the name of football, torch buses and dumpsters not in your backyard. Whether you win or lose, anarchy is good fun, boys being boys and all. You have the right to not be questioned to never be held accountable, to, in fact, do the accounting, to claim what has been offered. You have the right to shoot and not be shot. You have the right to demand God act on your order with the power of now. You have the right to complain when others' prayers get too loud. If you ask me to swear on a Bible, I have the right to ask if you've read it. Anything in your history can but will never be used against you. Knowing and understanding that if you cannot remember which of your grandparents were members of the Klan, then your history will be expunged. You have the right to hope your enemies don't read history. You have the right to have no enemies. To, you have the right to close your door on their grievances. You have the right not to be sorry. You have the right to be armed and assumed innocent. You have the right to protect your best interests. You have the right of way. You have the right to be right. There you go. Yes, yes, yes.
Well, no. I, I just have to interject. No, please, please, please do. Please do. If you want to connect the dots with what you're reading right now in class, you just got it right there in the screen. Hey. Sorry. No, no, no. You're what? This is your show. Um, you know, thank you, thank you, James, for 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 sharing that with us. I'm just going to act like you in the living room, and we just we just going. To That's my intention. You know? Why not? Um, you know, one of the things that was that that I mean, there's so many connections here with sort of the whole topic of banned books and 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 the ridiculousness of it. Um, but one of the things that keeps coming to my mind is how much uh, whatever is written, there's a piece of the person left in in that work. Right. And so just the idea of saying, OK, we're going to stop other people from sharing that is that that within itself is a form of um, there's a couple of words I want to use that I'm not going to use them. My um, word I would use that there is murder. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right? You know, this whole idea of like, you know, so I put myself in this work, I put something in my work and now someone is saying, well, no one else can share it. And what does that mean about then? myself, right? What I'm going through. So one thing that, again, is that threads through everything is this idea of like identity and, and, um, and self. So can you share with us a, a story or an experience that, um, that like inspired you to become an author in the first place? Yes. I've always um, had like some kind of facility with, uh, with writing and always been interested in writing some kind of way. I, I taught myself uh, to type when I was like in the sixth grade and took like a bunch of typing classes. So I was always interested in some kind of writing and some kind of creativity. Okay. Um, and for a minute, I thought I would uh, write screenplays because I was really interested in movies. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would try to write, you know, short stories and, and whatever's like that. But really, what specifically happened, and, and to address that very mm -hmm. question, is after that story was revealed to me, uh, about that I was adopted. Right. Um, I'm 19. So it's sort of like, I'm, I'm pretty much an adult and I'm pretty much, you know, ready to, to leave, um, and go off to college to the world, and do my right. own thing and go into the world. That piece of information suddenly made me feel like, okay, everything that I assumed was real and true before this moment is in doubt. Mm. You know, it's like who I assumed I was and in growing into is not fully true. Cause I just didn't know that um that I came from right. somewhere else. Right. You know, I was just kind of like folded into this family and it was all good. And I thought that was it and it was not. At that point in like the late 90s, um, to be honest, mental health was not a thing that people talked about. You right. know, it was it was basically, you know, go get yourself a drink or, you know, go get over your own, you know, issues or whatnot. <laughs> go exercise. Go do yeah, something. exactly. And and I'm actually going to say it. I, I think to a certain extent, the idea of a black male volunteering to go to therapy seemed ridiculous as mm -hmm. a concept. It, it seemed like it, it seemed absurd that, you know, that I would want to do that yet. I felt this desperate need to have a conversation, right. you know, because suddenly with this information, I couldn't go to the person I was closest to, my mother, because she would want to try to fix something. She would want to try to change something. And to be honest, I didn't really want to change anything. I just wanted to understand something better. Right. And so the closest person I was to, I suddenly could not really go into this conversation with her because she would misdefine things that I would say or, or and I didn't even know what I wanted to say. And I didn't know how to get into a therapy. However, I did know how to write. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that not really having a lot of uh, outlets, um, writing was an immediate outlet for me. Um, that after class or whatever, I can go to the library and just sort of like think and work my way through whatever the questions were that I had. And to be honest, uh, and I'm and at this point, I'm doing this kind of writing and I'm doing this kind of work then in my very early 20s while I'm still, you know, in college and 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 starting to 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 take care of my my mom or whatever it's like that and um and it was just it was like it was a sort of a self-imposed therapy that just sort of like helped me walk through things that I didn't know how to say out loud and didn't know how to ask anyone and didn't know didn't really have anybody to trust but I could trust myself to just kind of like work through it with uh, with words and work through it on the page. 
And the first open mics that I would go to, um, those venues allowed me to share those first poems that I was working on and those first pieces of writing that I was working on. And those open mics validated me. Right. I mean, you know, who would have, you know, it's like, thankfully, and thanks to, to God, thanks to every creator that there is, that I would go to these places and the poetry would work. Because it's like, if I sucked, if nobody really responded to me, I don't know what I, I would have done or how that would have worked uh, afterwards. But I was very grateful that people were so incredibly encouraging for me, um, to me. And... Um, and just accepted and uh, and heard me. And being heard was an incredibly healing thing. Um, and if I had to write about that and then go share that work in public in order to be heard, then then that was it. But it was it was helping and it was healing. So yeah. that's that's kind of kind of queer and how it it started. For me. Stepped in. So funny you talk about well not funny but you know the fact is you talk about um I'm in mental health but also just this idea of therapy right and I'm I'm from a West Indian you know, background. And the idea of th that's like, you, you say the word, you got to go to your room for like right. three, three weeks. You right. know what I mean? It's just, it's not something that's, that's spoken about because it's, it's associated with being weak. Right. Thank you. You know what I mean? And so um, similarly, it took me a, a much longer time to get to the space of like, okay, writing is going to be that, that vehicle, mainly because my dad loved words, right? My dad loved writing and literature and, you know, every kid growing up is kind of right. like, yeah, if he likes it, it's mm -hmm. right, right, right. I don't have nothing to do with it. Right. But it wasn't until much later on in, in life that, um, and it actually threw sort of hip hop. You know, I grew up in uh, in Brooklyn, right when hip hop and the whole sort of five elements of hip hop, graffiti, all of that, like I was in the midst of it. And being in that space, I remember writing this poem about um, being in my room and almost imagining sort of that I could take my experience and throw it out the window. Wow. Right. And then what would happen is like, you know, like dandelions, right. It'll just float. Uh -huh. And that's how my story will get to other people. Yeah. It's sort of like how um, you guys know about like uh, graffiti and like one of the ways that graffiti started was one individual who was in the Bronx um, at a, at a, um, and his building, I think it was 413. But he did his initials and then his building and, and then his building number and put it on the train. And the whole idea of that was that he was stuck in the Bronx, didn't really do anything. And the idea of his name, knowing that his name is going to go through the Bronx, through Brooklyn, through Queens and blah, blah, blah. Hence this whole, you know, kind of one of the pieces of, of, of graffiti, which is part of the whole hip hop movement. So, again, I remember sitting in my room thinking, like, if I could just extend my story and it could just float to people, um, that would feel like it would, the burden would be off my shoulders. Wow. I wouldn't be able to have to hold it anymore. Right, right. Um, and then when that didn't work, because, you know, it's real life, yeah. I can't just throw my stuff out the window. Yeah. Um, I started to kind of turn to hip hop and it was like, hip hop was, you know, there were these folks talking about, not necessarily my story, but unloading their stories on this on this page and then turning it into sound and music and vibration. And I was like, there's gotta be something in this, mm -hmm. you know? And then I started writing and I couldn't write rhymes cause I sucked at that, mm -hmm. which then turned mm -hmm. into sort of uh, poetry. But it's just, again, funny how so much of this comes from this, this need to find identity, this need to find who you are. Um, yeah, listening to you, I'm like, yeah, experience becomes a seed. Yeah. Pain, in a way, becomes a seed, yeah. a, a thing that you can plant and grow and push into something different. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, again, coming up in some of the places you come up with, it's like the idea, again, New York is a concrete jungle, right? So the idea of even planting a seed is crazy. It's, mm -hmm. it's no one wants to know my story, mm -hmm. you know? And so then writing um, and then being able to funnel all of that, the West Indian background, my upbringing in the UK, all of that, and funnel it through work. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get me wrong, when I say funnel it through work, it wasn't like I got up one day and was like, oh, that's it. Here's poetry. Right, you're right, you right. You know right. what I mean? It, was, it took time to sort of dig through all of that. Um, yeah, but you know, to, to shout back to something you, um, you like mentioned, um, 
I also felt the exact same way that my specific story would not be that interesting or be something able to engage with just everybody because the way I see the word mother is different from just about everybody that I would, you know, that I would uh, meet. Right. You know, it's like my image of mother gets bifurcated into two different places yeah. and two different things. So it's sort of like if you, you know, have like a lot of brothers and sisters, why would you care about my unique story? If if you've never been adopted, never had issues with family or identity yeah. or sense of self, why would you even go into this room where I had this conversation? And it's not like I challenged or cornered myself to do mm -hmm. it, but it was like, well, well, it's like a lot of stories have been introduced to me through books and 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 stuff like that. And it's sort of like, and I was writing just really to heal myself and to pour out in a process, whatever it was I was feeling. I wasn't really thinking in terms of, you know, here, I'm going to force you to read this thing that I'm working on. It's about, it was mainly and mostly about, I need to heal myself of this thing and get this out of myself. And, oh, there's this concept I was introduced to called open mics where I can actually share this because when I'm looking at it, I'm like, this seems like an interesting piece. This, the words in here are kind of cool. Maybe I can go share this and see what other people think. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of like, I, I guess it's a matter of just trust of of myself uh, and and just hoping that something I say gets echoed back. Yeah. It was it was a once I remember a sharing this poem about my dead father and this and at the end of that night this older white woman comes up to me and and she's herself is almost uh, engulfed in sort of like tears with empathy of what it was that I just did, yeah. which was a total surprise to me. I was like, of everybody there that night, I never would have chose her to right. be the one to really be present and to yeah. really hear what it is that I'm doing. So it's sort of like, it, it kind of taught me over time to just process what your thing is, what your story is, because you'll never know how that thing is going to get echoed back to you or who is going to echo it back. To you. If you feel the need to do it, um, then you absolutely should do it until it yeah. stops. I guess. Exactly. That's funny because you, you, you raise up a point that I think every, well, not every, probably a good amount of, of poets and performers, writers have that kind of a story where I read this thing and someone who I did not expect like I, I remember being at a at a um, national competition, a national slam competition, and I did this whole poem on um, hip hop, right? Just the names of hip hop and how it sort of graduated to where it is today. And this lady came over to me and said, thank you very much. And I was like, do you listen to hip hop? <laughs> okay. And she's like, no, my father passed away two weeks ago and I didn't know how to say goodbye until I heard your poem. Wow. I was like, you know that poem was about hip hop, right? Wow. <laughs> She's like, yeah. To this day, I have no idea wow. like what was in it that sparked that, but I think that's the that's the beauty of it, you know, as well is that folks are going to hear and take from the work, you know, uh, whether it be page or spoken, is they're gonna take from your story and, and sort of absorb and digest that as they need to, it's food, you know? Which springboards to my next conversation, my next question for you is sort of when you think about, you know, at the, I don't know if it's, if you wanna say at the end of a book, at the end of a poem, what what is it that you want conveyed to your audience? And I know that may change by poem, but is there a, a common thread or something that you're like, when you hear this poem, I want you to walk away with this particular thing? That is so weird because I, I I don't think I actually have a specific word to even say to answer to that. Um, because as you just pointed out, no two poems develop in the same way and no two poems in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know, it's like sometimes I, write something um sometimes i write something and the thing itself tells me how it's going to end gotcha um and it's sometimes not even obvious to me um sometimes the the thing itself just sort of stops um sometimes i've i've been in like in a workshop and people have pointed out you know, actually the poem really ends uh, at that particular stanza. Mm -hmm. And and that last one, uh, you just kind of don't even eat. And I'm like, oh, that's that's awesome to, to know in a year. Um, I, I don't know really 
what to what to say about that. It's it's a matter of some. I hate to say this, but I'm kind of stuck. I, it's a matter of some kind of intellectual intuition. This sort of thing that the best way I can say this is I can't sit and write a poem every single day. I can't sit and write a poem that I would like every mm. single day that would be strong enough or powerful yeah. enough. I can try. Um, but it seems to me that something in my mind opens up or signals me that this thing I'm thinking about is beautiful, it's, it's specifically disturbing, or I completely see and understand the through line of it, how to get from point A to point Z. Um, I see what the arc is. Uh, sometimes the thing tells me how it wants to be treated. Right. And I guess as a practice of doing art, it's about learning to trust that internal voice and learning to, to listen to it when it wants to share something with you. I, I don't have a philosophy or a practice or a pill you could take or a channel you could watch to show you how to end something. It's just a matter of of practice and and feeling it and intuiting it and and reading other people's work to get like some kind of like sense of how stuff like that works. Um, I wish I had a really clear answer for that, but it's such a it's such an esoteric, psychic, yeah. intuitive thing. I'm like I I don't know. I just basically over time, my answer is over time. I've just learned to listen. Mm. Um, and sometimes a poem has a very specific endpoint, and sometimes I sometimes a poem I just stop. Just yeah. stop writing and hope that that's that. That's that it. actually is it. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm glad you didn't have an answer because I don't have an answer and I was going to feel insecure if you had an answer. <laughs> well, thank God. <laughs> and you know, and I, I think about it and when I'm like, okay, I've ended this poem, you know, whatever place I've end, ended it, the one, the two things that keep, that always come back to me with work, whether that be prose or a story or whatever the case may be, it's, I want them to leave with more and I want to agitate. Okay. Right. And I don't know, the more is clear. The okay. agitate, I'm not sure about. Okay. Like, I'm not sure how. Mm -hmm. Right. But I want it to, I want folks to, I remember saying this when I first started, my first bio said um, something like, you know, you don't have to like my poem, but I just want you to go home, punch your friend, slap mm -hmm. your mama, do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I just want some kind of, you know, action out of it and then i know i've done what i was what i was supposed to be doing some kind whatever, of change yeah whatever that is you know i think uh that's true so yeah because like the the piece i just read you have the right i i don't have a dream of or an idea of how i want people to receive it um i don't know it's like you you just kind of have to tell me uh what yeah. that is it, it it was it was for example that that poem was written um when i was taking the acupuncture treatments um, and I, unfortunately, my knee had gone out and I had to go every week to this particular place and I had to do this long walk. And when that poem got triggered on that walk to distract myself from the pain that I was having, I would just record random lines into my phone. And it just took me a while to just organize and straighten all of those out so that they became a poem. Right. When it was finished, I kind of felt like, okay, this is the most I can do to this. I, I don't want this to be a 10 page epic or whatever. But it's like, I don't know, I don't have an expectation of how I wanted people to receive it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's sort of like, I, I would much rather, I feel like this is what I wanted to say. This is how it felt to me. Um, and then I want to really leave this material open for other people to talk about and discuss and leave it and leave me out of it. Yeah. My work was just to produce it. And then it becomes fascinating to me to have other people talk about or figure it out as to what it means to them. And I'm kind of like, that's, that's glorious. Please take it and go in whatever direction you would like. I otherwise have no goal or dream for how I want you to receive it. That's, that's completely up to you. It yeah. can suck and you can go to the next poem or you can just really feel it and engage with it. And, and that's awesome as well. I'm not in control of yeah. what you do when you we, receive we, or read those pieces. That's a beautiful thing to do because it takes so much off of your shoulders. Right. And I think if, if you hold on to that, that so influences what you're actually putting down. It, it feels like it's it's not the purity of what you want to write because you're worried about how that's going to stick, you know, um, elsewhere. So I, I want to bring back to banned books just a little bit. So what do you think? I know this is probably a hard question, but what do you think? I wouldn't say the most um, impactful thing 
to the world is by banning books. I don't I, I don't know that there's an ultimate, but like what's in your top what would be in your top five is like this if the, if you had to you know go to Congress and be like this is the reason why you can't do this stuff. What would that be? Yeah, it was nice that you brought up the idea that you know that silence is ultimately a form of murder. Um, and I and you know and it's like that's a really powerful message to me, especially with the idea of of writing something. And I, and as I'm thinking, and before I really try to answer that, I don't have any B or C answers mm -hmm. beyond that idea. Because, you know, I view your statement as, as being equivalent C to murder, because when an individual is silenced, or when an individual is sort of placed in, in a room or environment where society or a group of people have chosen not to listen or engage with this particular voice, that is a form of murder. And I guess in a strange way, by allowing um, you know, book bans and stuff like that, um, we're sort of condoning a kind of murder and a kind of voluntary ignorance for a particular group of voices. You know, and I'm like, that to me in my you know ignorance in life is actually counter to what the concept of America was introduced to me when I was a child, first learning about America, first learning about the idea of of you know integration and and the you know the great the uh, the great you know salad or whatever. Um, and I really don't understand that. I went very recently in April uh, to Florida for a for a writing retreat. I'm sorry. Respect, um, <laughs> because that did happen right after the the things with the with the book ban and and with some other um stuff as well. And for a moment, I thought I was going to engage with somebody to talk with somebody about that night, and I didn't. But what happened because I was thinking maybe I should try to write about this or address this. Huh. What was really fascinating to me is realizing that the book bans that were talked about in social media and on the news that at the time were coming out of Florida were, and please correct me, initiated by one individual with one specific complaint. And that unique individual placing that complaint in a certain place triggered that book or however many books pulled from every place. <laughs> yeah, I stopped because even repeating that, I'm like, well, well, that's absurd. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I and and sort of like, and I don't, and and I I feel like maybe I was the last person that really should be here to do this talk, and I'm like, well, well, you know, what about the idea that you, if you just don't like the thing, why are you keeping other people from engaging it? Yeah. There are things that I don't like, don't enjoy, don't want to engage with. I'm just not going to enter in those rooms. There's there's poets. Uh, who I just blatantly don't understand. Right. And I'm kind of like, I've tried to engage with this. There is really, this is a gorgeous, wonderful person. Um, they, they produce some interesting looking work on the page. There is nothing here for me to really engage with. That I guess you, this is just not my person. Right. right. <laughs> it's not like I want this individual shot in the street <laughs> for not letting me understand and right. have an introduction to whatever he's saying. I don't want their work pulled from libraries and from people being able to read and engage and talk about it because for everything I don't know, there's 10 other people who would think that's the greatest poet in the universe. Right, right. Um, so I, I just don't understand that sort of entitled empowerment entitled is the word man. right um of of wanting something pulled because on top of that what's not being said in that is there's no part of me that really believes that that person actually read that thing mm -hmm. that they're asking to get pulled in right. the first place yeah when when we were sort of doing these email exchanges about you know banned books or whatever i was i was thinking you know i don't really know if i've actually specifically read or collected any uh, banned books. I ended up doing that for movies yeah. sometime in the late nineties or whatnot, um, movies that were sort of hard to get or, or taken out of circulation for one reason or another because of, because of, because of. Right. Um, but 
but it's like I I just kind of don't get the the idea of wanting to have that sort of that sort of you know that sort of entitled thing. Yeah. You know, I just don't under I just don't get why you would like to put brakes on an individual wanting to learn or engage with something. Yeah. Um. I yeah. I just don't even know how to process it. Well, I, because you don't have that. You, it's not an A. You know what I mean? You, I, you I can't. You can't. I mean, because I go back and forth. I say the same thing. Like I can't understand why that would be the case. I mean, from its if you take it down from its like you strip everything away, strip politics, all of that away. You know, if you put your hand in fire, it's going to get burnt. So you know the next time not to put your hand in like that's what. That's what books do for us, right? Yeah. It's like you learn, you know about um, history, so you 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 quote unquote don't repeat it. Right. And then I go back to, well, when you talk about the United States, when you talk about America, like America is all about assimilation, uh -huh. right? I'm from, um, was born in, in in London, England, and the thing about England is that there's one of the things is that you go and the perfect example, I call it the Starbucks experiment, right? You walk in the Starbucks and there's someone from Marrakesh. There's someone from Russia. There's someone from Argentina. There's someone from, and the reason you know this is because they hold on to their identities within this sort of umbrella of London, right? Of, of England. The difference you come to America and until someone opens their mouth and maybe there's an accent that you can maybe make an assumption about, you have no idea. It's so, we it's America has a way and maybe it's you know coming from from the beginning of of America this idea of assimilating everyone being sort of this homogeneous look okay. you know look and feel and so when I think about that then I'm like well yeah because they want that makes sense because that just ties right into everyone wants the one story right that you know and so the only way to get that one story is to push that away that's not talking about that and the way that it should be or right. push that away don't agree with it at all but again it's it's just me going back and forth with like because it's so preposterous to think that this would even be a thing mm -hmm. then what's behind it right and so then i start kind of going going back and forth with myself and it's just um it is just an an, an incredible thing to try and, and and put your hands around when your whole being is about creation mm -hmm. when all you do is look to create the idea of like blocking that off just seems wild and and then you just do you're doing it with this i mean i know there's movies like uncle tom's um cabin is one of the first movies i've ever seen that was quote unquote banned you know mm -hmm. um but you take books out of it like artists do all kinds of stuff there's an artist in and there was an artist in the Brooklyn Museum that had a whole show. Um, the whole show, how do I say this appropriately? Um, it was fecal matter. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right? Mm. The, the whole show was like the paint, the, the whole artistry was off of that, right? And so like, but that's not banned? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, and, and not because I want to say ban it as an artist, but I'm saying that the, 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 um, the sort of open arms in one side to be like, whatever you want to do. I mean, there's a fantastic artist that was at Macla the other day. And um, he does everything with Cheetos. Mm -hmm. Like he sculpts out of, puts Cheetos together and then makes these amazing. So like we can be all encompassing mm -hmm. in this one space. But then when it comes to the books, which are supposed to be the like, you know, the sound, the the the, the letters, the things that people put in law or whatever, like we're so, we're so strict on what, or they're so strict on what they feel is, mm. is okay. Right. What's not okay. Right. It's, uh, it just feels like an incredible, and you've used the word, an incredible sense of uh, entitlement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who makes you, who says that you're the one that's the dictator of the things that should be known. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's it's insane. A few minutes ago, you you asked the question, "What's behind it?" And the only thing I could think of was was fear somehow. Mm -hmm. Um, I I couldn't think of a of like a of like a better word of why an individual wants to control or hide something away. 
And and when you mentioned um, the galleries, when you mentioned art, I, I was thinking, you know, and us talking about you know banned art or material. I was I uh, I was old enough to um, to remember the uh, exhibits that uh, toured regarding Robert Maplethorpe's work um that uh that was hugely problematic even on a congressional level yeah. um just because of the graphic nudity and just because he was uh queer and just sort of like engaged that lifestyle and photographed it in a really direct and um uncompromising way and and that unnerved a lot of people who wanted to protest and and shut that down despite the fact that they didn't really have to go to the exhibit <laughs> conversely <laughs> At the same time, because of the controversy he was creating, there was an artist who created another piece that I very specifically responded to in a negative way. And I was like, oh, I don't even need to see this in person or right. whatever. Um, I don't know what the artist was, but he did this piece basically called Piss Christ, um, which is which was a, uh, a crucifix with Jesus on it in framed and lacquered with the artist's own urine. And so I was like, well, you know, it's sort of like I don't need to have this. I I, I feel almost like this this work is is kind of pushing it, but it's not like I want to keep other people from engaging right, it yeah. if they're not bothered by that. I don't want to you know have the the museum shut down for displaying it. I'm just not going to go to that gallery for, right. for that week. I'm right. like I I kind of just don't um uh, need that. Uh, what do you call it? And there was there was something else I, I was I was thinking of as well, but it's just sort of like. Yeah, I I don't understand what the what the fear based control behind that is, what that's really like about. What's about? Yeah. 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 We see it everywhere, man. Yeah. Um, I know we're gonna get to to some questions from from you guys in a minute. There is one thing I do want to touch on though is, you know, when you first started, you talked about you said, uh, you know, I wrote this first book, and I thought that was gonna be the only book I've ever written. Why? It was, you know, it's a huge assumption. It's, it's, it just seems foolish to me that you, well, I, I have to admit, it's this nice, great achievement to actually get like a book published. I'm like, just because I have this, there is no absolute guarantee that I'm ever going to do this again. Yeah. There's no guarantee that I'm going to be able to, to assemble uh, another book. Before, before that book was published, I uh, self-published like six chapbooks, mm -hmm. and I was happy with that. Yeah. And I was happy with um, doing the stuff for myself, uh, making my own covers, and you know, mm -hmm. getting the money back from that, like just exclusively to me. I'm doing like a thousand percent profit. Yes. Um, so it just, it, it just kind of like it. It was lovely. It was wonderful. But I was not banking on the fact, on the idea that I might just get. A, a library of books finished. Yeah. I just didn't know what was going to happen with me. I didn't have any expectations. Yeah. Um. I was just sort of like, it feels like a really awesome, wonderful thing to get a book published anyway. And it's like, and I wasn't trying to jump into the future and be like, well, I'm going to end up doing this with my career. I don't know. I, I never planned on, on ever, you know, having two books and, and being here in San Jose State. It was just kind of like this beautiful thing that happened. It's like, you find something that uh, interests you, which writing certainly did, um, and you ride that wave until it takes you to someplace else interesting. And it's for yourself as well, I know. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of beautiful things that have happened to me and have been given to me just because I've been doing poetry. Yeah. You know, and it's been like a huge, beautiful key to me. Um, and I am so incredibly grateful for having that introduced mm -hmm. to my life to help heal me and to help share with other people. Um, I don't otherwise have any plans or expectations for what's happening um, tomorrow. I'm just because of like riding what the wave is going on today. Yeah. Um, so if another if a third book happens, which, you know, I'm hoping so, maybe. But um, but, you know, there's no guarantee for that either. I'm just riding for whatever happens and grateful for the blessings that uh, do get, you know, yeah. fall in my lap, I suppose. No, I, I, I love that. And there's, there's there's so much hope, I think, attached to that. I think with with me, um, and I kind of a little bit embarrassed and a little bit um, taken aback to, to to even say this, but my first book, I was like, that's all I'm going to be able to do. Not because of anything, like not because of anything I would do. It was more like someone's not going to let me do another thing or. I'm not going to be in the position to do this. I was putting so much of like the can't 
on myself, mm -hmm. you know, and the real reason I, I, and this is prior to me, I have a 13 year old, well, 13 going on 45 year old daughter. And, um, I, at the time, I didn't have any children. So for me, it was like, and again, it gets it gets layered on top because I was like, well, what can I leave behind, right? I don't know if I'm, I mean, I was, I don't remember, early 20s, right? And I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna be here at 26, at 27, this, this world is crazy. I was in Brooklyn and I'm like, you never know what happened. So I was like, what can I do to leave something behind? Mm. Um, for for someone, if that someone ever comes, and mm. that's why my first book was called Muted Whispers, because it was like this, like I want to whisper and tell them about my life, but I feel muted at the same time, right? Um, and it, it's 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 just strange how we 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 put all this stuff on us, right? So to come from all of that, and then now sit in a world where they're just like, nah, you can't. You, I know you wrote that. Now you can't have it. You can't mm. talk about it, mm. right? Mm. Um, there's a there's a a good friend of mine, Mahogany Brown, who wrote this book. Who was, um, it was actually one of the books that, I forget the dumbass's name that was on Congress that was like saying don't do it. It wasn't DeSantos. It was some other mm. one. Um, and he held up her book, which is called Woke Baby, mm. by Mahogany Brown. And I remember saying to myself, my daughter coming up, especially coming up, um, in spaces where people don't look like her. It was so important for her to understand, like, I'm not the only one or it's OK or and that doesn't I mean, that's not just a direct like black African-American experience. That's like anyone coming into a space and not feeling like they be belong or have, you know, ways to answer those questions in the form that they can understand. This book was incredible mm -hmm. for that. Right. And so to see that book waved around saying that, like, oh, other kids other little black girls can't see this wow. because what? Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing political in that. There's no, there's nothing arming in it. There's no, you know, there's no malice in the book. Right. Just woke. Well, you know, I guess because it had woke in it and that's a whole different world <laughs> within itself, <laughs> what folks think it is. But um, it's just funny how all of that ties back. And for me, it's like this real pull when I'm just like, it took so much to just say, I'm going to do this one thing mm -hmm. and scared to do that one thing, you know, um, and mm -hmm. to say now I've done it as a potential that someone just because of, like I said in the first poem, off a proclamation mm -hmm. can just be like, nah, that's that history is done. That's you're unwritten. Wow. Right. And if we and I'm going to go back to questions with you guys, if we go wrap this right back to how we started and we started talking about the work being about identity, being about self. And you ban my book, mm. you've unwritten me. Mm. Mm. You've erased me. This mm. is not just the book you've erased me, which is part of why this is so ridiculously preposterous. Wow. Uh wow. yeah, yeah. You guys still okay? Okay. Oh. I know we're about that time to so uh you guys got any questions for us? So we can hear you project your voice. So we do have an online. Okay. Um, so I just find it right now. One of the question is, in many Bay Area audiences and classrooms, Black people are minorities. So how does the audience demographic like impact the way that you like lecture and tell different stories? Yeah. So if I can understand, look, just the question is basically, we're sitting in audiences of different different types of folks. How do we how do we speak in those types of places just for folks who online who couldn't hear? I'll let you jump on that first, James. In the first years of doing uh, poetry here in the Bay Area, um, I would often do readings at uh, in places like Palo Alto um, uh, uh, and and just uh, other other cities around and other open mics that actually were primarily, primarily white spaces. I, there's, there's a couple of things within that. I did to some extent, and in some of those rooms, feel, um, I'm thinking of the word tolerated, but I, I'm not sure if I really wanna say that. What I do want to say is, is being in those rooms periodically, I 
did sometimes feel like no one saw me or no one wanted to see me until I actually spoke. Oh. For my own ego, that level of, of reception is a moment of pride to me because I'm like, I kind of don't care what your perspective or opinion of that you are projecting onto me when I walk into the room. I just want you to note that when I speak, I can do poetry as good, if not better than you can. I want, ultimately, it doesn't matter what my race is as far as I'm concerned, because you know I'm learning as much from you guys as maybe possibly you might learn from me. Many of those people don't want to learn from me. Many of those people are, many of those uh, open mics are insulated and I'll only have a regular audience of people who only return to that. And periodically those insulated rooms can maintain uh, whatever that audience is. And, and they may not ever engage with any alternative voices. Um, I felt a need because it was here in the Bay Area to make sure to represent what they did not expect. Um, uh, because I don't even know if I had a plan. I just wanted to prove myself standing in front of these in front of this audience that may not have any great expectations from me, may expect me um, to do, I have no idea what they would think would happen, but it's a, it's a beautiful honor to me that I could engage and go in those rooms and perform for them pretty much the exact same set I would perform for my family, for um, a, a more a black audience here, you know, in Oakland or, or Berkeley or whatever, and still have my same voice work. The goal I had, not just in doing those uh, racially different rooms, but just any room, is I just wanted the material to work. I just wanted you to be able to pick up the book and read it for yourself and have that work in your head. And I want you to be able to see it and ride with it if I'm just reading it to you aloud. I don't care what the race is. You know, I don't care what the what the um, sex makeup is of that room or audience. Um, I just want to be clear. And I want you, when you hear me, to know what I'm doing and what it is that I'm saying, and maybe hopefully appreciate the language. The language is the end of the line of what I want. Um, uh, the rest of it just happens. If that room wants to embrace me afterwards, uh, please do. I'm here for that. If they don't, that's okay. I represented what I needed to represent, and I feel good myself as I leave. So to me, it's just about the quality of the work itself and making sure that that can stand up without me being in the room, just as an event on the page or, or whatever. So hopefully, hopefully in there is the answer. This is a question for both of you. Um, do you think there's a limit? You spoke about um, leaving something behind like yeah. for your daughter. Do you think there's a limit of uh, which you can extend yourself materialistically um, in the world to show people who you truly are? Or do you think um, you have to go to great lengths in order to help people understand you. Yeah, you know, those are those are really, I think, cause the, for me, it ties into the two questions, right? Is this idea of, like, I'm still working, to be completely honest, I'm still working through it, right? Whether it be getting up into an audience and deciding, okay, y'all gonna learn today, or it's, but then I'm like, mm, I wanna come back <laughs> the next time, or, um, I've got a unique position where I can imbue a certain understanding to people who wouldn't get it otherwise, right? And so uh, uh, this is probably a bad example of this is that I've had locks for a long time, right? And so I remember working with someone, I was working with them, probably sitting next to them for the like six years, right? We're working together. And just in regular conversations, she's like, you know, um, you know, something about locks and, and, and it's like, you know, uh, someone was talking to me about it. And, you know, I know, you, you know, in order to get your hair like that, you don't wash it and you've got to. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, so I've been sitting next, like, literally, this is how we sit. To, this was in, in the UK. We sit together like this. You think if I didn't wash my hair for six years, you wouldn't know? <laughs> like, come on, you know? And so this idea of, I, I just wish you would have asked the question, you know what I mean? If, if you were really interested. And so I always go back to that and think, 
I'm in these places where I can give folks information that either they're too afraid to ask for, or just I'm just here to let them know, like, this is what this is. Like, woke doesn't mean that, you know what I mean? So it's like, so I, I tie it to to your question as well in the sense that um, is is there a limit to what I can leave behind? For me, it's limitless. I have to, because it's, it's my job, right? When not only I think just as job as a human, job as a black man in this world, um, I think I then took up the, the 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 flag of poet. So even more so, it's my job to leave as many breadcrumbs as I can to lead folks to these places, these places that I deem necessary for them to get to, to have a better understanding of whatever that thing is, right? So um, I don't I don't think it's limit, and it's just so compartmentalized because it's like in those situations, I also have a daughter, right? So I'm like. I've also got to leave breadcrumbs for her because of the stuff like this, she may not find out about why this is this and why you couldn't go to here before, or you own this piece of land, you just don't know, or this lake, these multiple lakes in America that people go on vacation on were actually um, black towns that the folks were killed and pulled out of, and then they poured water on it to make it a lake for people to go on vacation on, right? So if I don't leave these breadcrumbs because people aren't talking about it, she's never gonna know that, right? And so it's important to, to leave as much behind as I possibly can. And just to add to that, I, I agree completely um, that I, I feel like all of your work should be limitless. And I, and I feel like under no circumstances, irrespective of what kind of art you do, uh, should you ever try to hold your breath so you don't sort of offend anybody. I say, screw the entirety of all of that. I say you should use your work to push and to ask yourself some hard questions and to even ask the audience that at the same time. Because when I, what motivates me to go and listen to people I don't even know is the idea of growth, the idea that this person might actually say something that changes my life or perspective. And I say to always, as an artist, to, um, to push yourself into things that feel uncomfortable or slightly dangerous. If, it, if, it, if, if you, I, I say, if you have written a poem that makes you mildly uncomfortable to actually think of standing in front of people and saying it, I say that's probably a damn good poem. Um, Cause most of the pieces that I've written that I was kind of scared of, almost universally all of those pieces were really, people found those thrilling and people stood up for those. Um, so I'm like under no circumstances when you are thinking in terms of art, uh, should you ever think in terms of limit? I, I feel like all that you do, whenever you press or place a uh, color or ink to a page or a canvas or whatever you do in music or whatever is like that, you should always be pushing and trying to grow into something new and different. And there should be no limitations. There should be no gate around anything that you're trying to do. Maybe it feels good to release it. Maybe you feel like you want to hold it, but I feel like you should make it irrespective of anything else. Um, and let it speak to to you and whatever that audience is ultimately trying to make. It's going. It's a muscle, though. It's a muscle that you got to get stronger, and you're not going to get there right away, right? And it's one of the, the the hardest things, but the most amazing thing that I've learned over time is that, um, you it's it's not like okay, you've come up with this realization. Now I'm going to be perfect. You are going to fail, right? But you're going to fail faster. Right. And that's not to say that you're even going to change at the end of it, but you know who you're being earlier. And then you can make a choice of which way to go. Hopefully that makes sense. You know what I mean? It's like I I, I always, especially when I talk to younger folks, right? There's such there's such this this idea of of quick gratification, right? Um, but the reality I feel at least is that, you know, it takes it takes time to become who you're gonna be. Right. And so you just need to like give that time and and not feel like you're failing you're you're learning each 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 time and you'll get there just give you a little bit of context we spent about a week 
going through all of your poetry. <laughs> but you know, it's negative. Mm -hmm. um, so we came up with some questions, but you're also getting some questions that are just spontaneous too, based okay. on what you're talking about. Wonderful. So I really appreciate that, appreciate the flexibility. Um, and also, just to kind of give context to what I mentioned earlier, the class is now reading Claudia Rankin, just us. So the last poem that you read, and the reason I said it was so resonant, is because she talks about spaces where uh, people don't see themselves, right? Um, and she talks, she's basically like the, the, um, the expert at microaggression. Mm. Book Citizen and give you an excerpt from Just Us. So, everything that you're talking about, everything that you read for us, is basically reference material <laughs> for when these folks write their own narratives, yeah. right? And they can refer back to ways in which your uh, poetry, your conversation spoke to. The things that they're going to unpack for themselves. Okay. Do we have? Uh, we'll do one more. One more. Okay. Because we're okay, at time. Sure. <laughs> and um, there are no good reasons for banning a children's book unless it is not secretly intended to be for children, or it is designed to look like a children's book, and it is not, um, by its language. Or for example, um, what is that book um, that uh, that the audio book was narrated by Samuel L. Jackson, uh, Go the Fuck to Sleep? Yes. Okay. That book looks like a children's book. It is designed like a children's book. I worked in the children's room for seven years. I worked at the public library for 19 years. That book kept going back to the children's room repeatedly mm. because of the way it looked, and we had to keep grabbing it in you know, the adult section. Mm. So, for the public library, we don't censor, so we do not take it out of the library. We just make sure it's put in the right place. Yes. We won't remove it. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> me not having children, you can't really trust my answer though. I, my my thing as bad Uncle James is I don't feel like that language is going to murder or kill or or harm be harmful to anybody. That's just my own personal perspective as a as a uh, you know as a writer. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I, I guess I just don't. Yeah, I, I guess um, I guess I would ultimately just repeat myself that unless it's a unless it's a a, a uh, an adult book with children's book clothing. Um, I, I don't feel like they are, that that books should be you know banned or, or held back, um, even for uh, for like uh, young people. I'll, I'm almost of the mindset that if the child can actually put together the question to ask, they should get a direct answer. But that's me as a non-child having individual. You only come at Elbow on Thursdays and alternating Saturdays. Mm. <laughs> right on. I know. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm physically banned in people's houses. I'm sure that. Um, I think for it, that's a really hard question for me. And, and the reason why I say that is because on one side, I'm like, there, as James said, there's no reason to ban any book um, unless it's absolutely untrue. When you go back to um, during the enslaved period, when there were books out that said, okay, um, a um, chimpanzee was smarter than a, a slave because the chimpanzee held more pepper seed coin, pepper seeds, the skull held more pepper seeds than the slave, the chimpanzee was, was um, smarter. So those types of things were published in books that people held as as sound. This was real, right? And so, what, so I look at that and automatically I go adamantly like, no, that ban that, right? The thing is, though, I guess the poet in me, and maybe the having the daughter now, I'm like, if that never existed, she'd never see the extent to which people talked or try to twist history to bend to whatever they wanted to bend to, right? This is, 
And this kind of stuff happened all over, right? And so whether it's the Santo Domingo revolution or whatever the case may be. So it's a really hard question for me. There's a good part of me that says, you know, no stuff like that, no um, ban it. But then nobody would know like how people were really, really thinking. Wow. Well, yeah. yeah, right. Mm. Right. Mm. You know, so, Daughters of the Confederacy. <laughs> There's a lot of books, even for, as a librarian here, I saw in doing research that infuriated me, infuriated people that I was handing them to, but we have to remember those opposing viewpoints. You wouldn't see the other side or try to understand the other side without those opposing viewpoints. Right. It doesn't mean that we're, we are, we believe in it, we accept it, we, but as a librarian, we just offer you the information and you guys decide yeah. that's our job. And we don't censor in general for any library. Any librarian should not censor, even if I don't agree with it. Right. I still have to hand you the book without judgment. You never know why people are looking for Absolutely. what they're looking for. Absolutely. So on that great note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end this great event. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Great conversation to have you guys do. Um, we have one more event between you <laughs> tomorrow. We'll be in the larger room um, at 3.30. Please join us. And I want to conclude. Thank you, guys.